How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern with Jim Valley. And we got a lot to get into here today, Friday, here on this program. And I will be going solo, at least for uh, half this show, as uh, Mike Sempervivi apparently struck some sort of animal with his vehicle. And he's uh, getting a rental car as we speak. So, anyway, he's not going to be here today. But Dave Meltzer will be joining us in the second segment of the show. He's talking about the biggest stories in the newest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, including WWE once again record-breaking revenue for a quarter. And it's only going to go up as a lot of these television deals are escalating. Also, great news for AW Business. The Forbidden Door pay-per-view sold out pretty much immediately and uh, a lot more. But I do want to mention at the beginning of the show here, best wishes to Big E. Provided an update on his recovery from a broken neck. In a tweet on Friday, the former WWE champion shared that his C1 vertebrae apparently is not healing optimally. He is going to spend another four to six weeks in a neck brace in hopes of avoiding fusion surgery. For those desirous of an update, he says, my C1 apparently is not healing optimally. Spent another four to six months in a brace. Hopes I can avoid a fusion. But don't you fret. I've got a tremendous support system. And what shall be, shall be. Of course, he broke his neck March 11th when he took an overhead belly-to-belly from Ridge Holland and uh, landed right on top of his head. Fractured his C1 and his C6. But they were not displaced, no spinal cord damage, no ligament damage. So he was very, very lucky. And I uh, hope he will continue to be lucky here and uh, not need to get fusion surgery. So that's the update on Big E. And uh, all the best to him, his family, and his friends. We're going to do a break. When we come back, all of the news, Wrestling Observer Live. Here, Wrestling Observer Live. No Mike Sempervivi. But he will be back. Very soon. Dave Meltzer joining us for the second segment of the show here. And uh, we got a lot of business news to get into. I'm mostly going to talk the uh, business news with Dave, but a couple of notes here. And what is becoming old hat? WWE announced another record breaking quarter on Thursday 333 million in revenue in the first three months of 2022. Year over year increase of 27%. Operating income, $92.4 million for the quarter. Increase of 42%. Stock down, over 3% for the day at 55.49. although they weren't the only ones with stocks down. Revenue increase drivers. Media rights, $36 million year over year. Thanks to the February Saudi Arabia Elimination Chamber show. Oh, yes. Live events up 23.1 million from just a half million a year, a year ago. Consumer products increased 11 million. They made so much money during the pandemic. And now, as they have opened up everything again, now they're making even more money than they made in the pandemic as a result of uh, uh, different things, live events in particular. You don't run a lot of live events in the uh, pandemic when you're in that uh, Thunderdome. The video game, part of the consumer products increase, in addition to $4.5 million of live event merchandise, offsetting a $2.3 million dip in e-commerce revenue. Yeah, a pandemic ends and people stop buying stuff online, and they go to shows and buy stuff. That's what happened here. Uh, they mentioned their supporting press release, multi-year expansion of content for A&E, which will see 130-plus new hours of WWE-themed series and specials. Their uh, MENA region broadcast deal with NBC Group. Long-term e-commerce uh, licensed merchandise deal with Fanatics. Release of WWE 2K22. WrestleMania 38. Uh, they claimed, in terms of Peacock, that domestic unique viewership was up 61% year over year. Global unique viewership up 54%. Making it the most viewed, quote, premium live event in company history. Viewership in India, record 56.1 million views, 29% increase year over year. So, yeah, uh, things going very, very well as expected for WWE. And uh, their television deals uh, still have some time left, so those uh, deals will only increase. And then it will be time to negotiate a new deal 
And uh, provided there is not a, a global economic collapse or something crazy, they're going to get an even bigger deal the next time around. So long story short, if you're like, if you're hoping for change, you know, like raw, for example, I mean, don't hold your breath. They're going to keep doing what they're doing, creating content, whether it's good or bad, people are paying for content. And so there you go. We also had AEW business news. The remaining 3,000 tickets for June's AEW versus New Japan Forbidden Door pay-per-view sold out in minutes Friday as part of the public on sale, ensuring the event at Chicago's United Center will be sold out. This follows Thursday's pre-sale. Uh, they sold 11,000 tickets in 40 minutes on Thursday, meaning on Sunday, uh, June 26th, the event will have over 14,000 fans in attendance. Final number will depend on how many production hold tickets will be released. First co-promoted AW New Japan event. So for those of you concerned that nobody knows anything about New Japan, they're not going to want to go to this show. Well, they do. So, uh... This is the second time they've done huge numbers without any matches. Well, actually, the the Punk announcement. They didn't announce Punk was going to be there, but I think everybody knew. And so they sold uh, 12,000 tickets in their first pre-sale. And uh, that ended up being 15,316 for the night. And uh, this one probably will be doing somewhere in that neighborhood. Although as a, uh, as a big uh, event, there might be uh, perhaps more area taken up for production, but I guess we'll see. But that's the update. Uh, sold out very, very quickly. Same thing with the uh, Double or Nothing show coming up at the end of this month. That thing sold out uh, very, very quickly. So fans rich in the AW big shows. AW prepared to introduce trios titles. We talked about this in the new edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which, of course, you can read in its entirety at WrestlingObserver.com, as well as all of the back issues. Dave wrote that trios title belts have been made. So now it is just a matter of when they pull the trigger. Tony Khan was asked about making trios titles, gave the indication a few months ago that it was happening, but they didn't want to do the tournament until Kenny Omega was back. And uh, Tony Khan, in a media call, uh, this was actually months ago, uh, noted that he will be more interested in a trios division when Kenny is back. He said, we have a lot of great trios here, that's for sure. I'm very interested in it. I will be 100% honest with you. This is the most blunt answer I could give. I am much more uh, receptive to doing it when Kenny Omega is back. Now, I don't know when Kenny Omega is going to come back. So I presume that he's going to continue to wait. But uh, it's interesting when you watch the show and you watch certain things that they did. For example, they were really strongly teasing a uh, split between the Young Bucks and uh, Adam Cole and Red Dragon. And then uh, suddenly one week they just did a, a segment where Adam Cole said, listen, we've all been losing, uh, but we are strong as a unit, and we need to go prove that. And so then they did that 10-man uh, tag, and they just slaughtered their opponents, and then they gave the shirts to the Young Bucks, and uh, there's been zero teases of dissension in the last couple of weeks. So I could be reading too much into this, but when I saw that would appear to be a change, my presumption was they were expecting Kenny Omega back, and now maybe they're not expecting him back so soon. And that's why they're slowing down the split between the Bucks, Red Dragon, and Adam Cole. I don't know that. I have not been told that by anybody. I just watched the television, and that's the conclusion that I came up with. But for all I know, Kenny Omega could end up being the Joker. I don't think he's going to be the Joker in the Own Heart Tournament, but I suppose he, he could be. Canadian. So that's the uh, update on the six-man titles. Also in the New Observer this week, remember I was talking about that uh, WWE business and how you know, business is great. They're making money hand over fist. The Saudis are paying them, you know, $40 million a show or whatever. They're making all this money off television. So, like, if you want the quality of the product to change, uh, don't hold your breath. Well, you guys remember when they they were teasing the Usos against RK Bro in a unification match? And for weeks on television, 
they teased a unification match. And then they went to do the contract signing, and uh, the big brawl broke out, and Drew McIntyre ran in, and Roman Reigns ran in. Which, by the way, begs the question, did they ever sign that contract? Because if they signed the contract before the brawl, I mean, we should still be getting a unification match and storyline, but maybe they didn't. But the point of this is, they changed it to a six-man. And, uh, like an idiot, because I never learn, I thought, you know, they tease that damn match for weeks. So, maybe tonight on SmackDown... They're going to announce that all of the belts are on the line. And, uh, you know, unify the belts, whichever team wins. If, if Drew's team wins, Drew becomes champion. And if Roman's team wins, the Usos unify those belts and Roman retains his title. And as it turns out, this is not plans change. This is apparently... Planned from day one. From day one, the plan was, well, we're going to tease a unification match for weeks, but we're not going to deliver. We are going to change it to a six-man. So all of those storylines, all of that build, it was all, I mean, you can't even have more of a bait and switch than that. They had no intentions of doing the unification match. Now, I guess maybe, you know, plans do change sometimes, so I guess they could announce tonight that all the belts are on the line, but not looking like that's going to be the case. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Alive. Dave Meltzer joining us here today. New edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, available right now at WrestlingObserver.com. And there's a lot of news in the issue this week. And uh, we started this show here today, Dave, talking about the basics of WWE's quarterly report. And uh, you've got all of the in-depth in depth news on this. So what's what's the big story here? There really wasn't a big story. Um, Aside you know, from just, making a lot of money. They made a lot of money. A couple categories are up. A couple categories are down. A lot more people are watching the, the pay-per-view shows because they're on Peacock. And because Peacock has expanded its audience so, um, and, uh, you know, they made a big deal about how, uh, uh, the elimination chamber show was bigger than the prior Saudi show, but between the growth of Peacock, which was primarily due to the Olympics and also the fact it was on a Saturday rather than a Thursday, that kind of explains it, you know, Thursday afternoon, isn't going to be a giant number, uh, compared to a Saturday afternoon. But, um, you know, the mania numbers were, were. The, they said it was the the largest audience ever to watch a WWE show, but uh, I mean it's probably the largest ever to watch a pay per view show. Um, in fact, it was. But you know, I mean, it it paled in comparison to like you know you know like Austin and Undertaker. Eight million viewers for a Raw. Yeah, yeah, you know, or or, or Hulk Hogan and on Hulk Hogan and um, wasn't Andre the Giant. Yeah, it was Hulk Hogan yeah, and Andre Saturday the Giant. Yeah, Saturday Night's main event. Yeah, thirty-three yeah, 19, million in nineteen eighty-eight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not even. It's probably one tenth of that. But they claimed it was the biggest ever, um, and you know, just a, a bunch of stuff. But there was no real, no real big news. You know, Nick Khan was very bullish about Amazon and you know Netflix and. Uh, Apple and people like that getting into the wrestling business and more people bidding, um, you know, and that's probably going to happen and WWE's in great position because they are, a, you know, they're not the NFL, but they are a, um, you know, they're, they're somebody that can move numbers. They have a big fan base and can help a streaming service. And so um, there's going to be a lot of people interested in, um, in WWE when their rights fees come up and I'm sure that they will get a big increase and uh, they'll make even more money than they're making now. So we also had the uh, story in the observer about the uh, main event of the pay-per-view this weekend and how it was, uh, always planned to be a six man. Yes. So, so yeah, that, yeah, it was, there was never, that was always the plan. This was the way they got into the plan. Um, I have no idea if you're asking me why I have no clue. But that's the deal. Well, I can I can understand if uh, if all the belts were going to be on the line, and you're still going to deliver what you advertise, which was a unification match. But I mean, I guess we'll find out tonight. But not looking like it's going to be any sort of unification match. Oh no, 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 no! Definitely not a tag team un- title unification match on on on, sa- on this weekend. No, no. 
Why would you do this? Um, you know, it's weird because, you know, Vince Vince has a rule of not, like, it's not, not necessarily, like, like it, he doesn't have a rule against false advertising. He does that all the time. But he does have a rule as far as building up something that he eventually will not, not deliver. And there is no plan for a unification, or at least there was as of a couple of days ago. That could always change, um, although it makes no sense to do it. So I think that there's a good chance there won't be. So as far as like why he did it this way, I have no idea, honestly. I think that it's probably something they thought would draw ratings, and and uh, but they, you know, it doesn't look like they want ones that are tag team champions. I don't see any problem with having ones that are tag team champions because if you've been watching the show lately, like. Randy Orton and Riddle are on both shows anyway. So what would be but the they, difference? They don't, Just... But they don't want. To, they don't want to keep that. You know, they, they don't want to keep that uh, going for a long time. Um, you know, having so... having having the stars on both shows. Well, both 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 uh, networks kind of want unique viewer. You know, unique. Um, what is this? Unique rosters. I mean, you can do some of that back and forth, but really, um, Fox in particular really wants kind of exclusivity on its guys. All right. I, I, I don't know. I, I've been, I, I understand wanting like kind of a, an exclusive roster, but like I, all I ever hear about is, is complaints about, oh, we were promised this person and then this person went over there in the draft and then, you know, we thought we were going to get this person. Like if you remember when they first went to Fox, they had a graphic of, of a bunch of superstars for when they were advertising the move to Fox. Yeah, Charlotte And it was Ray. like Charlotte and, and then they did the draft and none of them went there. And yeah, I remember right. there was like, you know, well, how come we didn't get this person? Now? You know, you could get everybody if we yeah. just combine these rosters. Yeah, well, now all those people, Brock Lesnar and uh, Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair, uh, they're all there now, finally, and Roman Reigns. So uh, that uh, I know that I got a text from uh, Filthy Tom today, and uh, he was commenting on his, uh, I think he gave it four and a half stars, him and Moxley. That match was great. Yeah, this guy's like, oh, there's no way it was more than four. Oh, no, that, that match That's was, how he is. This was a great match, wasn't that it? That match was great. Yes. Yeah, 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 that yeah. That was the best Tom match I've ever seen in my life. It was the best Tom match I've ever seen. But I haven't seen like a million Tom matches, but I've seen I've seen dozens, and it was by far it was by far the best. Um, I really liked the match structure. I mean, that was the thing that I liked more than anything is just, um, you know, kind of like the timing of what they did and when they did it. Um, and it had a real, um, especially by the end, it had a real nice fight feel and... Um, you know, it, it's like for an independent match or for any match for that matter, it was really intense. I, I really, um, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm not a big fan of bloodbath matches. And, and the thing is, is that match, if you took away all the blood, it still would have been exactly as good. I mean, it was just a really well, really well put together match. And, um, Moxley is, you know, Moxley's really good at his, he's fantastic at his style. And um, and Tom's a real good opponent for him because of uh, the credibility they're, they're issue and things like that. They're perfect opponents. Yeah, yeah. Like when I saw that, when I saw that match, and it, it was like midway through the match. It wasn't even at the end. At midway through the match, it was just like. And Tom, you know, the other thing with Tom is he's he's there's certain things, mannerisms that he does when he comes to the ring and during a match. You know, not moves. Like as for like not moves wrestling, he's like really good and. It's like it's it's sort of like something that is unique to me that showmanship aspect that so many of the younger guys don't have and like I was watching going like you know he he really needs to be like an AEW because they don't have anyone like him um, you know what I mean it's not like he's better than everyone there or, or anything like that but they have no one like him and it's like the the you know his, his I, I just really like his idea not his ideas but just what things that he does it, it, it really impressed me yeah i uh i watched his entrance and i was like my god this guy is a superstar i mean he just he was so great during his his entrance and of course moxley his, comes out and the place just goes absolutely nuts yeah 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 his his entrance moxley you know moxley's got a fantastic aura around him especially on an independent show because um you know a lot of the top guys um, will go to an independent show and they'll work like they would work on television. And independent wrestling is very different from television wrestling. And Moxley totally gets the difference. Yeah, I remember uh, there was another Defy show, and uh, I remember the Briscoes were there. And uh, 
my God, they worked their asses off on this Defy show. I remember watching this match, and I, I'm thinking, like, do they think it's Final Battle or something like that? Because they worked so hard. And, man, Moxie went out there, and this guy didn't half-ass it, ever. I no. mean, dude, he and, went out there and just was, I mean, he was on fire. And, I mean, that's the thing. It's like a guy at his pay level working an independent show could just basically make an appearance. You know what I mean? An appearance, do his, you know, do his moves that people want to see, and everybody want to be happy. But he went way above and beyond, you know? So, I, yeah, that match was, um, that was a tremendous match. Yeah, yeah. So uh, AEW New Japan Forbidden Door is uh, it's all sold out. It's all sold out immediately. All the people who thought that uh, this concept wasn't viable, um, at least as a as an as a live show, we know it is. I mean, pay per view will be the pay per view, but the ticket demand was the highest for any AEW show since uh, All Out 2019, and the highest actually of any show in the United States in a long, long time which will get people mad, but it's just the truth. You know, I mean, there's nobody else that had 20,000 people uh, signed up at, to buy tickets on the pre-sale that was never advertised at all. You know, it wasn't like it was for today when it was advertised. This was the day before. I mean, people didn't even, most people didn't even know about it. Obviously, obviously 20,000 people knew about it. And they were, you know, there's, there's no doubt they were very much, um, there was, it was, uh, they were very lucky in a sense that the secondary market scalpers, number one, made a ton of money on the recent pay-per-view shows, so they knew to buy in. And secondly, um, there were no other big shows that went on sale that day. So all, a lot of the high-level scalpers that don't touch wrestling, but just, you know, kind of like, what, what, what tickets are we going to buy today? Um, there were, like, no big concerts, no big sports events that went on sale that day. So um, there were a lot of people. There were a lot of secondary market tickets sold. But the reality is is that, you know, those, those uh, you know, like on the... Um, the, the show in Vegas, right? Double or nothing. Um, so far, the secondary market people have made about four times the ticket price, a little under four times, about three and a half times the ticket price that they paid for it. So it's not like, you know, the, the demand isn't there or, oh, it's just scalpers buying. It's like actually scalpers are buying because the demand is so freaking high for these shows in, you know, because they're in buildings too small for the ticket demand. That's the reality of it. Funny thing is, the uh, last time there was a joint show in America with New Japan, it also did a one million dollar gate. Yes. So yes, you would have you would have thought that uh, you know people would have learned that you know maybe New Japan and AEW doing a joint show is going to do all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I was sure as a live show it would do really good. I didn't. I don't know it was a pay per view. I mean, like it's uncharted water. It'll do well. I mean, I'm sure it will do well. But you know, will it do like what CM Punk did for his return? You know, I'm guessing no. But maybe it will, and we'll all learn. And then if we do, you know, there'll be more. It's it's. Uh, but yeah, I mean, AEW. With well, the we gotta we gotta do a break. Sorry, Dave, but uh, we'll talk more after the break on this and take your calls. Observer Live. Back on the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. If you want the new Observer, 40,000 words, 40,000 words of news and information on pro wrestling, mixed martial arts, historical stories, analysis. It's like a half a half a death of WCW every week, Dave writes. Not quite half. Half of the original. One third of the noon expanded edition. But anyway, you can get it at uh, WrestlingObserver.com. Your subscription gets you the new Observers, thousands of back issues, all of our new audio podcasts, including this show, and uh, archives as well. So uh, if you're a wrestling fan and you are not signed up to WrestlingObserver.com, you're missing out, brother. So get up there and sign up right now. WrestlingObserver.com. You won't regret it. And you can read all of the stories in the new Observer, plus all of the breakdowns of everything from all over the world. So check it out. If you want to give us a call here today, the phone line is open. The phone lines. We have five lines because we're big time. 844-913-2727 is the phone number. 844-913-2727. If you want to send me a text, 425-780-780. 7566. That is 425 780 7566. Brian at wrestlingobserver.com is the email. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter. And of course, F4W Online on Cameo. Do you know that you can get a Mother's Day Cameo for just $35? That's right. 
So don't miss out. F4W Online, 35 bucks heading into Mother's Day. So go over there and grab one now. Dynamite ratings very quickly. The uh, show got killed by the NBA again. 833,000 viewers, down about 10%. Lowest number since May 19, 2021, over a year ago. Almost a year ago. 0. 0.32 in 18 to 49. Second lowest rating of the year in that category. However, as noted, it was the NBA. And uh, the show was actually fourth on cable in 18 to 49. Trailing only the NBA, the NBA, and uh, the NBA. So, for those of you that were panicking yesterday, don't. For those of you that are going to panic when you get to the Rampage numbers on Monday, don't. Bro, if Rampage even makes 400000 they should they should throw a party because that show is starting in less than two hours. Okay? My kid's not even out of school and Rampage is airing today. 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. Not an ideal time. And uh, for those of you that were looking at the quarters, Brendan Thurston had the quarters. And, uh, yeah, there was a pretty big uh, pretty big collapse in the last half hour of the show, which coincides with uh, that last hour that people were pretty critical of. Uh, they actually lost, uh, not a significant, but a fair amount of viewers for the end of the uh, Dante Martin-Ray Phoenix match that the fans were going crazy for. They lost viewers there. And uh, it pretty much stayed at that level for the main event, Ring of Honor, uh, was the um, unification match. Um, I could get both of those, but suffice to say, the show would have done probably, uh, what did the, the show averaged uh, 8.33. The show would have averaged 8.50 or 8.60 if you would have taken out the last half hour of the show. But uh, the last half hour dropped enough to drag the entire show down to uh, 8.33. So that's that's basically what happened. First uh, hour and a half of the show was very, very stable at about uh, 8.60 or so. And then it uh, fell off there at the end. So anyway, let's uh, see who's on the line. I know who's on the line because we have one person that calls from old Bellows Falls. You're on the air, Dagan. What's up? What's going on, Brian? What's up, Twitch homies? So I wanted to continue that discussion you were just having with Dave about the ticket demand for some of these big AEW shows. And it's kind of clear to me that they could start to run some bigger venues uh, for some of these shows. And, you know, I was just at that Boston show a few weeks ago, and that was a a small venue. And I'm kind of thinking, like, this idea of potentially running – thinking outside of the box a bit and maybe running like a Fenway Park in Boston or like a Wrigley Field in Chicago. Wanted to see what you thought about the idea of them starting to run some bigger venues or potentially some venues that you wouldn't expect, like Arthur Ashe Stadium last year. Anyway, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, I want to thank you very much for the call. I mean, here, here are the things that are obvious to me, okay? Number one, for the bigger shows, I'm not talking about your your average dynamite because – I'm not sure that Dynamite should be regularly running 12,000-seat buildings. I think that that would be a mistake because I don't think they're selling 12,000 tickets every week for Dynamite. But for the bigger shows, for the pay-per-views, for the uh, New Japan versus AEW, stuff like that, there's two things that are obvious. They need to run bigger buildings, and they need to raise the prices. Now, of course, it's going to be experimental because the amount of... The, the ticket prices now, it's clear that they would sell significantly more tickets to many of these events. Of course, if you raise the ticket price, maybe they wouldn't sell that many. I don't know. But, you know, as Dave noted, they've got uh, double or nothing coming at the end of the month. And uh, scalpers, when they bought those tickets, they're selling those tickets for four times what AW charged. That tells you something. AW is undercharging for their tickets for live events. Now, am I recommending they go out there and start gouging people? No. But, I mean, it's not like WWE tickets are cheap. I mean, I know Tony wants to make th- these tickets accessible and everything like that. But, uh, you know, when you got 20,000 people that are ready for a, a pre-sale, 
and uh, and twelve thousand get tickets immediately. Bro, there's eight thousand people where those tickets weren't accessible. Doesn't matter what the price was; they couldn't get a ticket. So uh, it, it's going to be something needs to change, and that is either raising ticket prices, expanding the size of the buildings, or both, and then finding the balance. I mean, if you can if you can regularly sell twenty five thousand tickets to your four quarterly pay per views and increase prices by ten percent, you know this is a business and. We don't know what the television landscape is going to be when it's time for them to get a renewal. They may end up getting a renewal for the exact same price that they're getting now. And if you look at all the people they're signing and how they want to be competitive and how they don't want to lose people to WWE, I mean, you're going to have to be paying your top stars more. Well, where's the money coming from if you're making the same television deal money? Well, you need to sell some tickets. You need to uh, sell more tickets. You need to raise the price of the tickets. You need to... Make your money in different ways. So I think the easiest way is raise the ticket prices a little. I'm not saying double them necessarily. And uh, and for the big shows, clearly run some bigger buildings. So if 20,000 people are in the queue for the pre-sale, 20,000 people get their tickets and not 12. So I think those are the two things that uh, uh, that I think... I mean, obviously there's a lot of things like get more bidders, get a streaming deal, sign... That's all beside the point. But this is something you could do now, and the evidence is there based on what's going on, that you could sell more tickets to big shows and raise the prices. If you want to call us, 844-913-2727. Phone lines are open, so uh, jump on if you'd like, everybody. We've also got uh, what other news have we got here. During a comedy show Thursday night, Malcolm Bivens addressed his release from WWE. He said, there's a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation. Was I offered a contract in February? Yes. Did I say no to this contract? Yes. Was I offered to be with Omos? No. No one said a word to me about managing Omos. Was I told about the main roster? Yes. And people they think I'm crazy, like Malcolm. You threw away millions, potentially. You walked away. Yeah, he says, I did, because I didn't want to do it anymore. And unfortunately, I just wasn't happy. It's Dan and Deliver. I had a conversation with the head writer, and I told him so. And then two weeks ago, I said the same thing. I don't think this is for me. And that's okay. Your happiness is not dictated by what people say you should do. It is dictated by what you think that you should do. He was a manager, obviously, of the Diamond Mine. And, uh, which is, by the way, it's impossible to say Diamond Mine. I've noticed. It's always Diamond Mind. But anyway... He says, shout out to Brutus, Julius, Ivy. I'm going to miss them. I love them like they were my kids. But you know, sometimes in life, you have to move on. People ask me, or they have been asking me, Malcolm, is this it for you? Is this it as far as pro wrestling goes? And for now, I have to say yes. have to say yes. Will I come back? Maybe. Maybe for the right price. So right now, at this point, Malcolm Bivens is out of pro wrestling. And it uh, it sure is amazing how many people go through this system, the main roster system, and they just want out. And then, like, the passion is killed. I mean, what this is, is it's a a sports entertainment company. And uh, and if you grew up and you, you love sports entertainment and you want to be a sports entertainer, I mean, maybe this is for you. If you are a if you grew up a professional wrestling fan and you and your brother listened to this podcast in college or whatever and you went to indie shows and you worked on the independents and you you did professional wrestling well this place probably isn't for you and Roderick Strong has tried to get out can't get out Candice LeRae now a free agent, so she can go anywhere she wants if that's what she ends up wanting to do. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what's what's happening here, as we've talked about it before, is uh, this business is split. If you are uh, if you're an old-school professional wrestling fan, then uh, you are going to gravitate towards AEW and New Japan and et cetera, et cetera. And if you grew up and you love WWE and WWE style and you went to WWE shows and you never watched anything else, well, that's probably going to be the place for you. 
because you probably aren't going to like it anywhere else. So it's going to be very interesting. We've talked about, uh, you know, everyone gets mad at me for talking about NXT, but there's a reason I talk about it. Like, that's the future of WWE. NIL deals. People that didn't grow up wrestling fans. People offered money to go become wrestlers. Anybody can be trained to be a pro wrestler in this system. That's their that's their feeling. So uh, this, this you know, you watch AEW and you watch NXT and, and WWE, and they're different products. And they're only diverging further. They're not coming closer together. And what's going to be interesting is, you know, when I was a little kid, I uh, I only watched WWE, and I watched Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. I watched Ric Flair when he was there. And uh, I know people are going, they're both. They're both sports. You're right, they are both sports entertainment, but they're totally different. This is diverging, okay? WWE is way more entertainment than pro wrestling, and uh, AEW is way more pro wrestling than entertainment. The booking philosophy is totally different. They're, they're completely different. My point I was making a moment ago was, I grew up and and uh, and I loved WWF. And when I was doing the YWF, you know, it had been uh, all, I, all I thought about was, man, you know, WWF, WWF Championship. I got smartened up about 1995, 1996, and uh, that was the end of wanting to do anything there or WCW or really anywhere else except the Indies. But uh, the question is, the kids today. What are the kids today, these young kids, where are they going to want to go? Are we going to have kids growing up that just want to go straight to WWE? Or are the kids growing up today wanting nothing to do with WWE and only wanting AEW, New Japan, etc.? And they're out there because I've talked to them. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. And... Uh, Someone had asked me about, uh, got a UFC tomorrow, Charles Oliveira and uh, Justin Gaethje, and uh, no longer a championship match. Oliveira missed weight by a half pound, and uh, his punishment is he has been stripped of the championship, and uh, tomorrow, if Gaethje wins, he will win the championship, and if Oliveira wins, he's still stripped of the title. So uh, laying that hammer down, so if you were... uh, uh, yeah, half pound. Half pound. But the thing was, he, he missed by half pound. They gave him an hour. He still couldn't lose the half pound. And so uh, he flat out missed weight. So uh, that's the end of that. He is no longer the champion and uh, cannot win the title tomorrow in their match. So if you're planning to get the UFC, that's the update on uh, on that story there. Uh, what do we got here in the text message bin? Oh, must I read about NXT Texas? Poor BJ the Virgin. Whether he gets over or not, this is forever going to be brought up to him in promos by his opponents that he was the nerd that couldn't get laid in NXT 2.0. I hope he... Well, you know, once he gets called up, I'm sure he'll get a new gimmick. If he ever gets called up. Well, someone's very... Uh, someone's very mad at me for getting banned from the chat. Too bad, brother. What do you want me to do about it? If you got banned from the chat, you deserve it. So don't get mad at me. Look in the mirror. That goes for everybody, okay? Yeah, I was in a mood yesterday, so why would you push my buttons? That's it. You know what to do. Don't be an idiot. That's it. There's nothing worse than being an idiot, getting banned, and then saying it's somebody else's fault. That's it. I'm not putting up with this crap. Jeff Hardy is 44 and Bobby Fish is 46. Yeah, it was, uh, it was rough. That match was rough. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up for today, everybody. Tomorrow, Jim Valley is going to be on the show, 10 Pacific, 1 Eastern, Andrew Zarian on Sunday. And uh, I'll be back on Monday. Also this weekend, tons of shows for subscribers to WrestlingObserver.com. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you again next time. Wrestling Observer Live.